And so uh, welcome everybody, whether you're here or watching the recording to uh, Dendron's Greenhouse September 2022 talk. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Bob Dotto. Uh, so Bob has over 20 years of teaching experience and mentoring experience in punk garages in the public education system. And now more recently in Zoom rooms and of course, uh, Discord rooms like this one that we're in. And Bob is an extremely prolific writer and so he's the author of Sitting with Spirits and also, uh, frankly, way too many blog posts and essays to track. And so there's, there are very few people who are as qualified to talk about Zettelkast and, and writing as, as Bob. So we're really lucky to have him here today. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that intro. Um, it's funny you mentioned the blog post. I was sort of going through them a few weeks ago, just being like, how much have I actually written here? You know, like over the years, because I started blogging in like 2000, maybe 2001 or two on varying platforms. But it turns out um, when your blog, when blogs are your main form of expression, you, you accrue quite a few posts <laughs> over the years. So it's in the six, eight, six to seven to eight to 900 posts or something crazy at this point. Um, much of that before Zettelkasten. And, and I will just say that with Zettelkasten, it has made even that level of productivity, which I, I, I think was pretty good. Um, it has just streamlined it and, and made it more enjoyable and even made, made it more sane in a way. Um, even though Zettelkasten is seen as kind of this somewhat strange beast out in the note-taking world or writing world, um, I have found that it has made... Uh, made my process a lot more understandable and a lot more fun to engage with. And in some ways more predictable, right? I can, I kind of know what's in my, in my Zettelkast. And so I know what, I, what's available to me to write about. So with that, I'll just go ahead and, and give you a little briefing on what this whole thing is about. That's all coming through little flames and all that. Okay. Yes. I know you, you said, said are you seeing my my slides changing now or no? No, not for me. I shall see the intro slide. You used to. Oh, interesting. All right, hold on one second. Let's see. Mm -hmm. What about now? Upcoming four week course. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave this when I when I blow it up into like full screen. For some reason, that's not showing up for you. So I'm just going to leave it in this kind of condensed screen, if that's OK. And I'll talk you through it. Um, the only thing I will say um, is that if I change it now, do you see it saying, what is a Zettelkast then? Yeah. Okay, so one, um, we should just pause for a second. This might be a technical thing um, because my slides are moving slides, right? So images kind of move in and out. Um, so without doing them full screen, you just have all the images stacked on top of one another and it can look very confusing. Um, so we might have to figure out some sort of technical assistance on that. Uh, when you share your screen, uh, there's two ways you can share. You can either okay. share an application or you can share the screen itself. Usually okay. sharing the screen itself works better. Okay, well, let me check that out. Hold on one second. Okay, so I can applications and you say just share the entire screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's try that. Okay. And now are you seeing the, uh, okay, great. And then if I go to here, you now see what is a Zettelkasten? Yes. Oh, perfect. The fades are working. All right, so let's go from here. What is a Zettelkasten? So many of you probably know this already, but a Zettelkasten is often translated as either slip box or catalog coming from the word Zettelkasten. Zettel meaning slip of paper or card, depends on the context of its use, and Kasten meaning a catalog or a box, a way to hold something. So that's where the term comes from. Um, we, when we talk about Zettelkasten, we tend to be talking about Nicholas Luhmann's specific take on a Zettelkasten, which is presented on the right. So one of the first things to know about Zettelkasten 
is that Nicholas Luhmann did not invent Zettelkasten. Um, Nicholas Luhmann invented or created a way in which to engage with a Zettelkasten, right? So a Zettelkasten is simply any box of cards or slips of paper or note cards. And these have been used for centuries, honestly. Um, but Nicholas Luhmann had a unique way of using the Zettelkasten. So even though when we say Zettelkasten today in online forums and all that, and even in here, we're referring to Nicholas Luhmann, that is not the only way to use a Zettelkasten. It's just that he had a particularly unique way to use a Zettelkasten. So, but he's the reason, he's one of the reasons why we're talking about Zettelkasten today. Another reason is um, because of this gentleman on the bottom left here, um, Johannes Schmidt, who's in charge of the archive, of Nicholas Luhmann's archive of Zettelkasten note cards. And he's sort of thumbing through them on the left. Uh, Johannes Schmidt is an amazing resource for understanding how Nicholas Luhmann's Zettelkasten worked, some of N Nicholas Luhmann's Zettelkasten workflows, his sort of day-to-day -day schedule, all that kind of stuff. He wrote... Um, about four articles on Zettelkast, and really, really, really two or three. One of them is actually a condensed version of one of the longer ones. But so there's about three or four articles that that Johannes Schmidt wrote on the Zettelkast, and that are in English at least, and they're really great resources. So I highly recommend checking him out if you're interested in uh, Nicholas Luhmann's specific approach. But the real reason that we're talking about Zettelkast in these days is because of Sanke Ahrens and his book, How to Take Smart Notes. For most people, that's their kind of introduction into Zettelkasten. Um, the interesting thing about that, um, Sanke Ahrens created a, a, or added some terminology to the Zettelkasten, a lot of which we use, most of which we use today. So like fleeting notes or permanent notes or literature notes, these are Sanke Ahrens' terms for what Nicholas Luhmann was using or, or creating in his Zettelkasten. Nicholas Luhmann did not name his notes with the exception of maybe an index um, or an index note. Um, but otherwise, the terms permanent, fleeting, literature, these are Sanke Ahrens' terms. Um, Sanke Ahrens uh, talks about Zettelkasten mainly in a physical sense, and Nicholas Luhmann's Zettelkasten was, of course, physical, or, um, yeah, the uh, analog system, we sometimes call it. But, of course, these things have translated into digital, uh, varying digital platforms. So the just to give you a sort of broad spectrum, Dendron would also fit into this, and you can kind of get a sense of where. Um, on the left, we have it's either Rome or it's um, LogSeq. I forget which one I, I took a screenshot of, um, but they look very similar in a lot of ways. But on the left, you have the kind of outliner approach to taking notes. We're using blocks. On the bottom right, you have um, the archive which was created specifically for a Zettelkasten or for developing a Zettelkasten, though because it's really just a platform that handles um, uh, text files, it could be used for many things, but its primary usage is for Zettelkasten. In the upper right is what I have historically used, at least over the past year or so, which is Obsidian. Um, and it's not really a hybrid of the two, but it's but it's uh, it does a bit more than than both of those. And again, Dendron would fit in this kind of schema um, as well. Um, but really, a Zettelkasten is two things. Okay, so a Zettelkasten is a way of doing things. So it's a method or a methodology. You might sometimes hear the Zettelkasten method, as well as a physical or digital object. Okay, so it's a thing, and it's a way to do a thing. Right. So to start, we'll just talk about the physical digital object. So again, Sunke Aarons is down on the left corner, just to remind us that a lot of these terms are, come from him. But a Zettelkasten can be thought of as a container comprised of multiple compartments. Okay. So for some people, they think Zettelkasten is just those notes, those kind of main uh, so-called atomic notes. But really, a Zettelkasten is a larger structure, again, digital or analog, that can hold multiple kinds of notes. So in a in a typical bare bones Zettelkasten, it would you would have a compartment for Zettels or the main notes in the slip box that comes from that's another term that Sanke Ahrens uses. Um, you'll have things called literature notes or bibliographic notes or citation notes or reference notes. Those all are referring to the same kind of note basically, which is a note taken while reading or consuming some sort of media. And then you would have a compartment or folder for other notes, right? Sanke Ahrens refers to project notes, notes that you would develop when you're 
creating a writing project, right? You have an article you want to work on, so you're pulling notes out of your Zettelkasten and you're creating a, a project note, right? A note that outlines how the article's going to be, and you would keep those separate as well, but all of which would be contained in your Zettelkasten. Nicholas Luhmann really had two uh, compartments, one for the main notes, or many for the many compartments for the main notes, and then a few compartments for literature notes and indexes, those kinds of things. I think they're often referred to as bibliograph notes context. Um, this is what a physical Zettelkasten would look like, at least a very pretty one, made handmade out of wood, and it's kind of open face, so you can see it. A lot of times, you know, when you look at Nicholas Luhmann's Zettelkasten or other um, analog Zettelkasten, you'll see them as drawers. This one is kind of nice. Uh, at least it helps us see what's inside because it's kind of this whole open system. But again, this is basically the same thing, right? You have your Zettels or your main notes, which are on the left. Those are all the atomic notes or the single idea notes that are being linked. You have the project notes. So he's using Aaron's system in this sense. He has these project notes in the middle, which are notes that kind of help him develop the, the long project he's working on. So this person was working on an ecology, ecology project. So this is the chronology of the study of ecology, if I recall. So that's the long project he's working on. And then on the right, he has his literature notes and indexes as well. And you can see on the far right, there's just probably blank cards and probably some pencils and stuff there as well. But all together, this makes up what we call the Zettelkasten. So the Zettelkasten, again, is not just one compartment. It's not just the Zettels. It's the whole system. In a digital sense, this would look like, uh, this could look exactly like what you see here. The top folder is called Zettelkasten. And inside you'd have your Zettels, a folder for your reference notes, a folder for your project notes. Um, in full disclosure, I don't use project notes. I, I barely even use structure notes. I write kind of, when I write, I take my Zettels and just jump dump them into the article that's going to be. Um, so I don't have too much use for project notes, but I do have a lot of use for a folder that's called needs finishing and a folder that's called sleeping. And those are just notes that are sort of in transition. They haven't really graduated to becoming official Zettels at this point. So we have a folder for Zettels, literature, project notes, and other kinds of notes. Again, com container comprised of multiple compartments. Okay, so a Zettelkasten is also a methodology, a way of doing things. So a Zettelkasten is a note making and a note linking system that helps people do primarily two things, okay? Make connections between ideas and enhance creative output. Okay, I star these, put arrows and circle it because it's really important. If you, if you have a Zettelkasten or you're building out a Zettelkasten, if you stick to these two things, making connections, if you, every time you put a note in, your understanding is that I want this note to connect to other ideas, idea in this note to connect to other ideas, and hopefully this will help me in developing some sort of creative output, then you are kind of on the straight and narrow path, narrow path to having a really dynamic Zettelkasten. Now, creative output could be many things. For most people, it tends to be writing. That's historically been the case with Zettelkasten, but the creative output could honestly be many, many other things. It could just be the play of thought, just thinking about things could be your creative output. The making of a play, musical compositions, all sorts of things could be used, uh, could be seen as creative output when it comes to Zettelkasten. So how do we do that? This is the most super simple workflow I could show you. For Zettelkasten, we take notes, we put these notes somewhere, so we store them either in digital or an analog place. Um, we establish connections between the ideas in those notes, and then from there, we create. That's the workflow and it's most basic. We take notes, we store notes, we make connections between notes. Of those connections, we create something. This is the workflow in a slightly more blown out sense, right? So this is the workflow a little more uh, developed. So using some of Sanke Aaron's terminology, on the left, you'll see we have fleeting notes at the top and we have literature or reference notes at the bottom. A fleeting note is basically any note you've taken your entire life. Okay, so fleeting note, the fact that it's called a fleeting note is kind of funny because it's just a note. It's like literally any note you've written down before you walk to the store, you know, a reminder note, 
anything is considered a fleeting note. Some of those fleeting notes will turn into zettles, but not all of them, right? So your to-do list would not necessarily be a zettle. A reference note is a note, I think I mentioned this before, but it's a note, a long note you take while reading or watching or listening to something. So as something comes up that's interesting, you take a little note, say page 23, talks about XYZ, and you have a list of those in a single note. Whatever is relevant to your work or whatever catches your interest, you turn into a zettle. The rest, the fleeting notes, just go into the trash because you don't really need to keep to-do lists around once you've done the things. And literature and reference notes you store in a literature or reference note folder because these become indexes or useful information if you ever want to retrieve information from the source. Your zettles will obviously go into your zettle folder, your main notes folder. And from there, you would create something. Right? So out of your zettles is what you create. Now this was the long this was sort of the bigger workflow starting from fleeting and reference notes to zettles to folders to creation but in that middle the zettles and the lit notes that is your physical zettelkasten so what you're seeing here is actually the method and the physical zettelkasten in one place So are there any questions at this point before I go on into what a zettle is comprised of or how a zettle looks Then we'll keep going. So the Zettel. OK, so the Zettel, sometimes called a permanent note, though that's a little bit of a misnomer because literature notes are also permanent notes. But the Zettel is known as the final edited tidied up note. These come from jotted ideas, checklists, drawings, meeting notes, margin notes. Again, your fleeting notes. But Zettels are also made off of brain dumps, literature notes, your own content, right? Brain dumps are you get up in the morning and you just kind of like, you know, mentally vomit onto the, onto the page and just get all your thoughts down. You can create zettles off of that, right? There are certain aspects of what you wrote down that might be useful or you think might be useful. So you would take that and make a zettle or a, a main note out of it. Literature notes I mentioned, and your own content could also be repurposed for a zettle, right? So I write a newsletter weekly, or at least I did up until August, I took a two month break. Um, but in those newsletters, I, I mean, those newsletter, newsletters are made off of Zettles sometimes, but I also make Zettles off of the newsletter, right? So if I write something in the newsletter that I think could actually become a more useful note to be used later, I'll just take it and reword it and put it into a Zettle. So once these notes are parsed out, pared down, refined and, and edited, they become finished permanent Zettle or your main note. I'm using the term Zettel and main note interchangeably. So other ways to think of Zettels are as single idea atomic-ish notes. So you know, there's always a debate online about what's an atomic note and how useful they are. Really, it's just atomic-ish, right? It's notes that are small enough or ideas that are small enough that you can repurpose them as you need be. Zettels come from fleeting or reference notes. They're considered permanent. They are dynamically linked and they're reusable. So on the right, you have one of my zettles from, from a while ago now. Um, and here you can see some of the elements. So it is a single idea atomic-ish note. That's the, the main portion of the note. That's what I'm mostly engaging with. You can see that it comes from a fleeting or a reference note. So there's a quote down there. This, so this note, this idea is built off something I read in a book. Um, it's considered permanent in the sense that um, there's no reason to take this note out. Once it's in there, it's there. You can, if you disagree with it a year from now or 10 years from now, you can simply make a new note and link it back to this one and talk about why this you no longer believe this idea. Um, but you can see at the top, I have an alphanumeric system that I use um, to label or identify my notes. Uh, the notes are dynamically linked, meaning these little blue lines are linking back to other notes that this note relates to. And it's reusable. So even though this note is referring to, the, the, at least the idea in this note is referring to its parent, which is listed there in the bottom, sort of the bottom middle, this note can also be reusable in other trains of thought. So you can see this note comes out of the 7A branch. Um, the numbers don't have any meaning. It's just consecutive. Whatever comes next is what you use. But uh, within the branch, sort of ideas develop. So the 7A branch tends to talk about this topic. 
But you can also see down at the bottom, there are notes in the 4A branch and the 3D branch that deal with the subject from a slightly different perspective or sometimes a very different perspective. And this note or this idea could be repurposed for those branches. Okay, so that's a Zettel. So once we have our Zettels, we go into the creation portion. And this will take us into the last section of the, um, of the presentation. So Nicholas Luhmann referred to his Zettelkasten as a communication partner. Sometimes that's translated as a writing partner. But it's this idea that your Zettelkasten is something you work with, right? It's not just a storage system. It's when you're taking notes, you're thinking about the notes that are in your Zettelkasten. When you're working with your Zettelkasten or digging around, you're thinking of things to write about. And it kind of goes back and forth, right? You're thinking about what you want to put in, and you're also, when you're in there, thinking about what you want to pull out. So it becomes like this extended mind or a partner that you write with or some sort of companion or helper to help you write pieces. So the way that works in very simple terms is like this. You have your one note, right? Your Zettel, right? Which has some idea. But it is not alone. It is sort of networked within uh, the Zettelkasten in many different ways. And there's many other notes surrounding it, both prox proximally, like in proximity, or even far off. Um, because each node is linked to other notes, not every other note, but a note may be linked to one other note or three other notes or however, you'll start to see that trains of thought developed. So when you go to write with a Zettelkasten, what you're doing is you're looking to find the trains of thought that are interesting to you or inspiring or something that's catching your attention. So when I go to my Zettelkasten, I'll look for, I'll see all these connections. Like on that last note, I had one train of thought and I had another one and I had another one. I sort of pick based on my interest, which one I want to work on. So I kind of ignore the rest and I just pull out the notes that are interesting to me in the way that they're being connected. Once I do that, I'll organize them on a, on a page in whatever way, right? So even though I might come across a note, like uh, one of the notes first, it doesn't mean that that's the first note I'm going to use. It just means that that's my starting point for making the connections. I'll lay these out on the page, and then I go through and I edit ideas. I fill in the gaps. Just because an idea is repurposable or reusable doesn't mean I have to use it in the way that it's found, right? Once it's writing space, these things become, there's like no rules, right? The idea can be changed. I can, I can cut it in half. I can rewrite it. I can disagree with it. I can do all sorts of things. The writing, the notes are just prompts, right? They help me get things going. And that's what makes little casting so helpful is because it really does help get things going. So you lay them out on the page, you work with them, you massage those notes to get them the way you like. And then if you're writing a longer work, you simply do this over and over again. Right, so one of these pages here on the, on the right side with the colorful notes, one of those could be a chapter. One of those could be an essay. For me, and this just changes with each person, I know that I can write a blog post with one note. Like a note itself could be the blog post, or I could just have the idea and riff off it. Um, but I, I know that one note is all I need. Sometimes I don't need any notes. In fact, lots of times I don't need a note. I just start writing. Some people, they need more notes to build out their blog posts or their essays. It really depends on the person. But typically, you know, some amount of notes, five, six, seven, whatever it is, developed enough can be a chapter. And then you do that again, and you have your next chapter. And you do it again, you have your next chapter. So you can take those trains of thought that I was talking about, and one of them is one chapter, one of them is another, one of them is another. And pretty soon, you've amassed, if nothing else, a really robust outline to develop a book, right? If that's your desire. So linked notes can become books, they can become articles, they can become videos, comics, rock operas, knowledge, uh, anything you want. I've heard of people using Zettelkasten for their fashion show. They, were, they're, uh, they're, they work with fashion and textiles and they were using a Zettelkasten for color and for fabric and all these kinds of interesting ideas. That to me is super interesting and super exciting. Um, and I've heard people using it for music or for coding or all sorts of different things. Um, but ultimately, it could be used for many things, many forms of expression. So just as a quick review, um, a Zettelkasten or a Zettel starts as a fleeting or a literature note. This becomes a Zettel or a main note. These notes are then imported into your Zettelkasten. 
they are then connected. So you establish connections between the ideas in the notes. These connections, when you're ready, can form an outline. So you see connections developing. You bring them into a new note or to a new page or a new document, and you set up an outline and see how things are working out. And then from there, you create something of your own. And that's that. That's the 101 Zettelkasten course. And I'm happy to talk further, answer any questions. Um, if you are interested, just so you know, if you are interested, I do have the cohort, the second cohort starting in October, or October 11th, actually, so like a week and a half away. If that's something you want to do, that's there for you. Just get in touch with me. I'm happy to get you set up with that. But aside from that, that's my introduction to Zettelkasten. So yeah, thanks so much, Flav, and uh, let me compliment you on the, the production values of that presentation. Was oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, of course, also an extremely clear and thorough introduction to Zettelkast. Um, oh, I hope so, yeah. So the links to that, where that course is on the web and uh, to your Twitter and to your site as well, we'll put those in the description afterwards, as well as uh, sure. any notes that you may want to share or... Or I don't I don't know if you uh, if you would want to post the slides after, but uh, we can talk about that. Um, but so for now, if there are uh, any questions, you can either uh, just go ahead and and uh, speak them into this voice channel or uh, put them in the tea time text channel and uh, also in the YouTube live stream um, if mm -hmm. any of you happen to be uh, watching from there. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll I'll start off with uh, one question, which is uh. This addressing scheme, because on one of your slides, mm -hmm. you have the 7A and then uh, 4B, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, I was wondering, um, could you speak a bit to that? And is are those the connections that you were talking about? and Or are those different? And uh, what makes one node apparent to another or just connected in some other way? Sure. So yeah, so Nicholas Luhmann was working with an analog Zettelkasten, meaning like hard copy, you know, physical object. Um, and in order to find notes, he needed a system that he could reference notes, and notes could be referenced easily. So he created a a numbering system or an alphanumeric system, well, just something I, I I think he got it from some book from the 40s or 30s. But really, it's just any alphanumeric system or any numbering system or identification system that works for you. Uh, sometimes this is called Fogelzettel, which just tends to mean like next note or the, the following note. Um, but basically what it is, is it works like this. You start with your first, if you have no notes in your Zettelkast, <laughs> you start with a note and the note is apples are good for your health. And you say that is note number one, right? I, I start my notes with one A or that's what I started with. But let's say you start with one and then you have a note. You're reading further and you say, oh, some doctors think that too many apples are not so great for your health. So you say, well, this note actually speaks to that other one. So that note is one. So I'm going to call this note 1A or 1 slash 1 or however you're breaking it up. And then you put the book down and you go and you watch a YouTube video and it's on surfing. And you, you find something in the surfing YouTube that's really interesting. And you say, OK, I want to put that in my Zettelkast thing because I may want to like learn more about that or write about that or whatever. Now, this note has nothing to do with apples, nothing to do with whether or not doctors uh, think apples are healthy or, or too many are not healthy or whatever. So you would say, well, this is note two then, because it doesn't speak to those other ones. So this is note two. Now it turns out you're really interested in surfing, not so interested in apples anymore. So you start taking a lot of notes on surfing, and then you have two, two slash two, two slash two a, two slash two a one, two, a, you know, et cetera. And you, you start, all these notes are relating and you there's a note in there that's two slash two a one a you know you have a note that speaks only to that one and not to other ones so you branch off that and all of a sudden you're sort of developing this is the so-called bottom-up approach without starting with subjects at the top you are developing a section of your zettelkasten on surfing whether you use those notes in the future or not doesn't really matter what matters is that it's interesting to you so section two of your Zettelkasten is about surfing. Section two in my Zettelkasten is about AI, right? Because that's just what was happening. Um, and those numbers aren't really, the, the thing about those numbers is they look like you're establishing 
an outline or a structured argument because you're like, well, this note, you know, you're doing the slashes and the A's and the ones, and it looks like they're speaking directly. You're not establishing an outline. You're just showing a relationship. So for you, it doesn't really matter that a note is 2 slash 2A, 1B. It's just that the note that comes after that is speaking in some way to that note. But it, but maybe semantically, that note would actually, they'd have to be reversed or something. It doesn't really matter because when you go to write, you're going to take those notes and reorganize them in the way, in the way that works for you. If that makes sense. Yeah. So, so in a way, it's tracking more the ideographic history of your thinking and mm -hmm. of your particular research rather than any That's exactly. relations. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. A lot of people get caught up in that and they say, well, I have this new note. It should really go before this other one because it's like more high level or, or top level. Like it's more meta or something. And it's, I have to correct people all the time. <laughs> I'm like, no, it, you just, it's just a relationship. So you just put it in and it just shows that there is a relationship. It doesn't show the nature of the relationship. That happens later on a structure note or, or a, a, an essay you're working on or whatever. Hmm. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask as as a follow up to that, uh, since you mentioned uh, bottom up organization, and also mm -hmm. that that people sometimes uh, get anxious about the meta level. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's something I've seen in in PKM, and and maybe you've seen this in in the people you mentor as well. That um, you know people are looking for the perfect system and trying to have mm -hmm. everything perfect from the ground up. And um, I was wondering. Um, yeah, if, if that matches with what you've seen and also how do you address that in people you mentor? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, <laughs> I encounter that all day long. Um, okay, so there's a few ways to talk about it. One way is that we'll talk about it from Nicholas Luhmann's perspective. Nicholas Luhmann had a problem to solve, right? He was like, I'm taking all these notes. I want to be able to reference them later, but I also want to have a build a system where I can like write for the rest of my life and never have writing, writer's block. So he kind of invented this, sort of invented, developed, he sort of got the idea from a few different areas, but ultimately created a system, duct tape one together that worked good enough for him. The way we come at it is we say, I heard about this Zettelkasten, it's really cool, I want to do a Zettelkasten, <laughs> right? So we, we're sort of coming at it from a weird angle, so then we say, well, I want to do a Zettelkasten like he did. How did he do it? What, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? It, and he didn't have those questions because there was no right or wrong. It was like, did it work? Right? Is it working? And for him, it worked. Right? He'd used it for 40 years or something. So we see a lot of that kind of, um, how can I make a foolproof system? How can my system be completely future-proof? How, how can I make a system that has no gaps, no holes? Nicholas Lumen's Zettel, Zettelkasten had lots of holes. You know, it, it's it's not a so-called perfect system. It's a system that works for him. So what I try to teach is that if you get the concepts and you get the gist and you get really good about the gist of the method and, and what these notes are and why we do them, how you how you work them is going to be unique to you, right? Like my literature notes often look very different than other people's because I don't like lots of text in my literature notes. But some people I teach really want whole captures. They want big quotes on their literature notes. So they just want quote, 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 quote that they can reference. To me, I look at that note and it's just like way too much. But for them, that's useful. So that's fine. But as long as they get how where that note fits into the process, then they're free to do however they want. The Zettelkasten is meant to be, it, it's meant to be a little like um, cheeky. You know, Nicholas Luhmann, when he talks about a Zettelkast, and he talks about it almost in terms of like, it's coy, it's kind of like toying with me, you know, like, he refers to, um, there's a note he has, where he refers to a note that is challenging all the other notes, like the idea and the other notes, like this new idea is challenging everything. And he, he refers to that note as being a trickster note, you know, like, so there's this whole, like, kind of fun, playful relationship that he has with it, which I often don't see. And people who are trying to learn it, they really want to have it like, is it this, this, like, you know, and that's, you see that with all scenes, you know, I, I've encountered that with every subculture I've ever been in, which is many um, people who just want to get it right. And that's understandable. I think that's noble. But um, there has to be some, 
some play. You have to kind of dance with it a little bit. It's got to be a little looser, you know, than, than I think a lot of people treat it. So it's almost like the more common failure mode is for people to be paralyzed in the analysis and trying to get things right more than somehow distorting the, the mechanisms and principles that make it work so well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, if you know what you want to do, like if you're a writer, let's just make it easy, right? You're a writer and you want a Zettelkasten to help you write. If you are being helped by your Zettelkasten, you are doing it right. <laughs> Could you do it better? Maybe. Does it matter? Maybe. But maybe it, in most cases it doesn't. You know, you're only here for however many decades, right? <laughs> like you should probably just get something that works for you and just tweak it over time. I mean, Nicholas Luhmann absolutely tweaked it over time. His first Zettelkasten is very different from his second. He changed the way he did things, not overhauled it, but there are differences. Um, and people should feel free to, you know, to do that. The only reason they don't often is because they feel like the need they have to present it to the world. Like with social media, it's often like if you have a Zettelkasten, and you can't keep it secret, you have to show it. And to show it, it has to be perfect because then you're going to get all these comments. But really, if it's for you, it's just what works, you know? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's that's interesting because um, it's like so so Nicholas Luhmann, we all know he was an academic, and he was mm -hmm. in this context where he was publishing academic literature as his as his main work. But now we're in this sort of world where everyone can publish, and lots of people have their their own blogs, regardless of what line of work they're in. And there's um. It's like so much of the ambiguity around Zettelkasten, as well as so much of the interest in it, comes from differences between his context of application and and the ones that uh, that people are coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Nicholas Luhmann. I mean, just to note, you know, Colin. I certainly call him an academic, but he was not a traditional academic. You know, like he he wasn't like someone who had worked. You know, like uh, an academic from day one on. You know, he was seen as as kind of outsider in some way. I mean, his writing is known for being discursive and nonlinear and circular, and and his ideas. You know, he had the theory. You know, theory of society. You know, th this kind of this grand theory. Like these are things that academics who are really trying to stay, <laughs> like, be a good vanilla academic. That is not his way at all. You know, and, and he's very open about that. You know, you if you see interviews or read interviews with him, you know, he'll talk about he's like, my brain just works non -line non linearly, right? Like I just I have to do it this way because I'm I circle through things and you know, he yeah, he was he was a lot more postmodern in the like classical sense of being willing to engage with contradictions and being willing to be things being unsatisfactory. Um, unlike many others, many other like kind of traditional academics, you know. Maybe he was uh, ahead of his time in some way or would be well suited to our, our contemporary discourse. Yeah, both. Yeah, that. And I mean, he was in the 60s, right? The like 60s, 70s. This is the post the era of postmodernism, right? So right. Derry was there, uh, you know, Foucault is around. Kristeva, all these people thinking in these very strange and writing in very interesting, unique ways, they're all there. You know, they're all happening in Europe, especially. And he was not necessarily a part of that, but certainly informed and, and was informing that. Right. So, yeah. I, I mean, speaking of uh, scenes and informing and being informed by, uh, one thing I mm -hmm. was curious to ask you about is uh, your sense of uh, sort of parallel or near adjacent systems and or methods to Zettelkasten and... and Mm -hmm. um you know what's what's around are are there some that are suited for somewhat different use cases um do, do they boil down to the same thing are they irreconcilably different mm. well i mean you have some of the obvious ones that are out now like nick milo's system uh, which is not really a system it's more kind of a way of appreciating notes and and he certainly has his terminology and vocabulary and stuff um i've talked about that in, in articles and with him uh, before, you know, it's comparable, you know, anything, any system that's coming out now that appreciates or has at its center, the idea of linked thought or linked ideas is going to get you in the ballpark, you know, whether it's like digital gardens or light kid or, you know, linking your thinking or, or any, anything along those lines, any Matushak 
I was going to say, but he's also he's pretty much a Zettelkast in person. Like his notes basically reflect the same principles, same methodology in a lot of ways. Um, so those are all really comparable. There's differences in the use cases. You know, with Nix, it's not geared towards um, towards uh, output, whereas Zettelkasten Zettelkasten is like <laughs> it almost begs to be used for output. You know, you're in there and you're like, you've got the notes. They're sitting there, and you're like, if I just take these notes and just move them over here to a document, like I've got an article. <laughs> it's just so it's so quick. Um, so it kind of really pull like wants you to write, not that you have to, but it's it sort of really a, it's kind of a forcing function, I guess you could say. Um, with Nick Milo's system, it's just a little different. It's the way the notes are handled, the the sort of openness of it all, the the comprehensiveness of it all, right? It, it's you can put so much more into it. It doesn't need it doesn't pull you into writing. It could just be kind of like a life operating system we we once referred to it as. so. So in that sense, there's a difference. Um, but there are certainly analog systems. You know, there are people who have, you know, I for decades used Moleskin. You know, I just used Moleskin. And when it got too much, like I had so many journal entries and so many thoughts, so many song lyrics and this and that, I would, at some point, if I was being good, go through and then make an index in the back and be like, this page is for this or this. And then that's a form of it. You know, it's a form of linked thinking in some way. Um, just kind of a really rudimentary system. So yeah, they're out there, um, and certainly more so now, because of because of how to take smart notes and the platforms and the ability to do the linking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I'm really there's there's so many juicy threads to follow here, and I'm really yeah. getting into a kind of flow with you. But I uh, yeah I'm wanting to make space right now for uh, just in case. Are, are there other questions from from people who are here right now that uh, that you know, haven't come up because uh... so we're riffing so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I yeah. don't mean to uh, break off the riff, um, but something Please in do. a similar vein. For so one thing that I do see a lot is people, for example, coming to Dendron and they hear about central casting because I think it's definitely. Um, made a name for itself as like, hey, if you're getting to note taking, this is like a paradigm that or a framework you can use to think about note taking and knowledge management in general. Um, but then I also see a lot of people drop off after a while because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what they wanted to do was not produce blog posts. They wanted to manage their to-dos. And mm -hmm. for that, like something like a bullet journal worked out much better for them. And so in that similar vein, like what would you say that Zettel Kasten is not well suited for um because what I see generally is just like this trend of people trying to apply to just about every part of you know that knowledge management workflow. Yeah. Um I'm going to answer that in one second. I'm just going to turn the light on in this room so I'm better to be seen. Mm -hmm. So give me one second. Okay. Sorry, like I said, I'm in visiting England and I'm many hours ahead of you. Um, so that's a great question. And it's one I love to talk about because I try to define Zettelkasten rather narrowly um, for that exact reason, because people come to it, they hear it's the system for linked thinking and um, you, know, you can establish connections. And they're like, sure, I've got all these ideas, but I also have like my task manager. Like I, I need a task manager, a project manager, or you know, to-do lists and, and what about keeping track of all my friends' phone numbers and all stuff. And those tend to be the people, again, this is just from cursory and interacting with people online, but I find that these tend to be the people who then drop off Zettelkasten either happily and just move over or they're like, Zettelkasten is dated, old, doesn't work, you know, and, and then drop off. And the reason is for what you said. There are there are things that Zettelkasten doesn't do well, like to-do lists. I, I wouldn't even know where to put them, to be honest, in, in a Zettelkasten. Like I use Todoist for my for my to-dos, right? Because that's what it's for. Or some, you know, that's what I use, but people could use any number of them. So a Zettelkasten is not great. Or at least I haven't seen anyone really lever for that kind of life operating system approach, right? Keeping track of 
of to do's or keeping track of your projects. Um, it's just not like I, I often talk about this in respect to Tiago Forte's system. Some of you may know building a second brain and par and stuff. Like Tiago Forte isn't doesn't need to link ideas because Tiago Forte's taking notes on how to become a better father and taking notes on how to learn to sail. And for him, it doesn't matter that there's an, like, he is not looking for the connections between sailing and fatherhood, right? Whereas someone who's a writer or, or um, not that he's not a writer, but someone who's writing and trying to find these connections, they absolutely want to know the, the, the overlap or the connections between those things. So Tiago is much more project oriented. He comes out of GTD, right? He comes out of getting things done. So that's, that's what he does. Um, Zettelkasten, you know, in the course I teach, I, I te uh, call it that it's for creative expression because it's creative expression is a different way of thinking, right? When I want to find my, when I want to know what to do today, I don't want to go following links, right? <laughs> like, I just want to know what's on my to-do list. I don't want to have to go into my skateboarding section and go over to my spirituality section and somehow follow the links to find out, oh, today I actually need to go to the doctor at 12, right? I just want, I just want the information. So. So in that sense, um, a Zettelkasten, I would say, is not so great for to-dos, project management, task management, management, that kind of stuff. Um, but you can use those other systems for you writing your papers, right? So they work together very easily. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And it's also what I found. I guess as a follow-up to that is, have you seen... So I've seen great results from people using Zettelkasten for their own creative output. But have you seen it work well in a multiplayer setting? Let's say like two people or like a group of people. No. Are there thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but I have seen people talking about it and people asking that question. And the thing is, is I think absolutely. I mean, I, I use my Zettelkasten in a very straightforward way. I use it for writing, <laughs> right? But I'm always like, you know, someone brings up some other use case like that. And I think, please do it because it, it's so waiting to be used that way. A communal Zettelkasten or a collective Zettelkasten. Um, I have, I feel like I've heard over the past year or two, someone mentioning it, that they were using one, they were building one for their work or something. So information they were organizing for their work. So that was a little more of a collective approach. Um, but I haven't seen anything published or released online or, and, no one has really published their notes as like, we are doing this as a collective uh, Zettelkasten project. But um, yeah, it's all there. I mean, I would, I, I come out of like the art world and the writing and the, the, the weirdo world of like, you know, the experimental artists and writers and stuff. So I come out of this world where to me, the Zettelkasten is like an, a branch of that. You know, it's like, you should use it for painting. You know, what an amazing way, you know, it's almost like, like, um, Dali in some way you put in all these strange words and put, run them together and see if you can get it to create something for you. But the Zettelkasten can be used for that, right? Follow this thread, follow this thread, put this color in, here's a dream you had, and then connect it and be like, here's this, here's this, this, this Frankenstein I made. Isn't it beautiful? You know, <laughs> something like that. So. So yeah, there are there are ways it has not been explored yet, and one of them is the the one you mentioned. I think the collective or the multiplayer approach, but I think it should. Yeah, uh, same page uh, <laughs> on that. I think this potential. I also think it's hard just because knowledge management, like the same technique, can work for one person and not work for another. Because yeah. I find that it's highly personalized. Even mm -hmm. if you're using the same technique, you're like thinking of it differently. Mm -hmm. um and okay so my last question for this um is just i've noticed for zettelkasten you you know you have a note you link it with other notes it's great for kind of exploratorially finding here's you know a connection to this thing i'm writing mm -hmm. one challenge that i've had is when there are you know are lots of links to the same note and then it becomes a little overwhelming because to me, it's just like, it's 10 links, it's 20 links. Um, and those lead out to 10 other links and all those links start looking the same. 
Mm -hmm. And um, do you use any sort of weighing mechanism? Like even when you're like exploring it, like some, not all links are equal. One link is more important than another. I mean, you're not deciding this before the fact because it's bottoms up, but at some point there's also a use for having some sort of, I find like a filtering mechanism if you have like a lot of material. So like, mm -hmm. what do you, um, what are your thoughts on just balancing that out once you, you know, have a lot of links? So, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it speaks to one of the reasons why I am against automated linking. Um, I'll see people come on and, 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 you know, develop like little developers coming about and being like, I've developed this way that you know, the the notes will link automatically, you know, and maybe you guys are involved in that. I'm not sure, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. Are you involved in that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're more on the opposite of like, if you link, then it's like very deliberate. Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Same page. So there is like a human, I think like the human element is part of the, is like the, the governor on that meaning like it holds it back like there's only so much you can do there's only so much time in a day if you look at my notes maybe at max i will have three four links linking out just because how much time can i spend looking for links right like you can have a zettelcast of 300 notes and you will have enough writing and enough connections for probably the next 10 15 years it's just it's so much um it's just almost like exponential um using that word loosely um so I don't really find a need to um, to put put a filter on that because I find myself to be a filter enough. What I will say though is when I have links, I always want to establish or, or write down the context for why, and that also slows the process down. But so on the note I shared, there was one that just said parent. The reason I don't have context for that is because the note is the context, like that note is kind of speaking to that other note. But at the bottom, I have what are called jumps. Um, these just jump out into other trains of thought. There's not a hierarchy. It's just that was the note I wrote the note in response to. These are notes that could also be employed. But you'll notice the, it'll be the link, and then I'll write a quick sentence being like, see this other note because this can you could use this note to talk about X, Y, Z. And then below that, same thing, because you could use it to talk about this other idea. So when I go to open the note, I'm sort of, I'm seeing the trains, of, I'm seeing the directions right in front of me, you know, so I know pretty much pretty quickly that well i could take it in this direction that's fine but if i add this note like that's a whole nother it's a whole nother thing right so i don't like there's the human in me i don't want to include it because i just want to make it easy right i don't you know i don't want to spend time you know wrestling that note in if i don't have to because i could just write another blog post or another essay or another book or whatever um so yeah, so it's sort of a roundabout answer, you know, like I don't have a filter. Um, I use let my humanness get in the way um, happily uh, to kind of make sure that things are not so overdone, you know, and I don't, I don't, as long as I have one connection, I'm fine. You know, I don't need, I certainly don't need five or, or 10. That may happen, but I, I don't need that. I, I, I have found there's plenty in the handful of connections. Yeah, less is more. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. There's always another note, so you don't <laughs> you don't have to. Yes. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that if if people are interested in Zettelkasten, to um, kind of go easy with it, you know, I, I see a lot of people come at it and really try to like kind of own it in a few days. It took me maybe three months of wrestling with what is that like how it worked to maybe two months to really get my head around what's even going on here, um, and that's because I came from a very top down perspective i was like where are like where are the folders you know um so you don't have to get it all at once you know just take your time with it um ask around i'm on 
Reddit constantly answering questions um, as Taurus Noises is my handle. I'm in the Obsidian Discord, at least. Um, I'm happy to hang around here, too. And you can always just shoot me questions. I, I, as you can probably tell, I love speaking about it. So I'm always around to kind of help out and, and uh, set people on the, on the path. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Bob, for speaking yeah, to absolutely. me. And uh, with that, I'll consider this September Greenhouse Talk uh, officially concluded. So, uh, have a good month and week and, and life, everyone. All right. So I'm going to end the Thanks recording again. here. But, uh, okay. So we can, we can hang around a little more.